Uh, I'd, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tretsky and the rest of the scientific uh, board and the, the board of, of CCF for inviting me to speak here today. I'm a third year uh, pediatric hematology oncology fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Eric Robb at Johns Hopkins. And um, I'd also like to th thank uh, Alicia for uh, uh, her memories of John Eric. Um, so I'm gonna talk about glutamine metabolic inhibition and how it synergizes with l asparaginase in uh, MCN-driven pediatric solid tumors. Uh, with a special focus on neuroblastoma and um, also rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, so Dr. Meany already provided us with an excellent background on neuroblastoma, so um, I'll go through this slide pretty quickly just to say that um, it is the most common extracranial solid tumor, as you heard, uh, in children. Uh, but it disproportionately accounts for uh, a higher number of uh, pediatric cancer deaths, and a, a lot of this Mortality associated with uh, neuroblastoma is due to that high-risk, harder-to-treat disease. Um, and poor prognosis, uh, in part, is defined by amplification of a transcription factor um, known as MCN, which Dr. Meany also um, spoke about. And MCN itself, um, though various uh, researchers have been able to inhibit its uh, directly in cells, in, in tissue culture, in the lab, translating this to the clinic has been um, difficult. And therefore, um, other modes of targeting kind of downstream of MCN uh, to indirectly inhibit it um, are needed. So this is just um, a graph from a clinical trial just showing how the um, survival um, is so poor for any uh, neuroblastoma with uh, MIC amplification. Uh, and this is regardless of the histology of the tumor otherwise. Um, and also, as Dr. Meany uh, went through in detail, the high-risk disease for neuroblastoma is uh, treated very aggressively with chemotherapy, surgery, transplant, radiation therapy, immunotherapy. And um, despite all of that, survival you know, is in this kind of 55% range with all of these advancements. And um, those children who do survive bear uh, a lifelong burden of the intensity of therapy that they receive. Um, so new approaches are desperately needed. So um, looking kind of in the literature uh, for what things downstream of um, MCN amplification we could possibly uh, target uh, to indirectly affect the function of MIC itself, um, we investigated glutamine metabolism um, because um, downstream of MCN you get a reliance on glutamine for cellular metabolism in tumor cells, which um, glutamine uh, is, serves many functions um, to help tumor cells grow and proliferate and evade cell death. And um, it contributes to, to many different functions, but Highlighted on this slide, um, glutamine can be used to make new nucleic acids for uh, DNA replication and cell division, new amino acids for protein generation. Uh, it can be funneled into the TCA cycle to generate energy for the cell. It can um, be used to generate a protein called glutathione, which is used to detoxify tumor cells. And so all of these functions could be targeted if we had um, uh, glutamine uh, metabolic inhibitors. Um, and fortunately, there, are, um, there is a um, very old compound called 6-diazo-5-oxo-L-norleucine, or DON for short, because it's a lot easier to say. Um, and this was first characterized back in the 1950s um, and tested as a potential chemotherapeutic agent in adults. Um, and then uh, subsequently, in the 1980s, uh, there was a phase one clinical trial of DON. Um, in, there was a single patient on that study with neuroblastoma who actually achieved a complete remission with DON as a single agent um, for a period of time. Um, but despite this uh, encouraging result, no uh, additional study on DON was, was done in, in children with cancer. Um, we are also working with um, 
the group of Dr. Barbara Slusher at Johns Hopkins, uh, who runs the Johns Hopkins Drug Discovery uh, team. And they are actively working to create pro-drugs of Don to make it orally bioavailable, to improve drug delivery directly to tumors. And we are working with them to test some of these compounds in our systems. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk about four cell lines uh, that I've worked with, uh, two that are MCN amplified, uh, B2C and IMR32, and two that are not uh, MCN amplified, SY5Y and SKNAS. And um, you'll see these names as we go through the slides. So um, just as a first uh, look to see if Don uh, has an effect on the growth of neuroblastoma, uh, and uh, specifically a greater effect on MCN amplified cell lines. We just did a, a basic growth assay called an MTS assay and saw that um, the MCN amplified cell lines were more sensitive to Don treatment than the MCN non-amplified cell lines. Um, then to kind of parse out what Don was doing, we first looked at proliferation using a compound called BRDU and just for simplicity this is a compound that labels dividing cells, cells with undergoing DNA replication. And we saw that MCN amplified neuroblastoma cell lines had a decrease in proliferation in response to Don treatment, whereas MCN non-amplified cell lines were unaffected. Then to look at cell death, we did uh, a couple of different assays for apoptosis, um, one looking for uh, cleave caspase 3 staining in cells, another looking for cleave PARP, which is another uh, protein in the apoptotic cascade, and we saw that in MCN amplified cell lines, Don treatment leads to increases in cell death, um, but the MCN non-amplified cell lines were, again, unaffected by the glutamine metabolic inhib inhibition. Then uh, taking it over into um, mice, we uh, gave uh, nude mice, uh, or immunosuppressed uh, mice, um, uh, uh, MCN amplified flank tumors, and then used on um, as an intraperitoneal injection twice weekly to uh, treat uh, the mice once the tumors had become measurable in size. And kind of much like that pediatric clinical trial where the one patient with neuroblastoma had uh, response to uh, the Don treatment, we actually saw about 40% of the flank tumors regress entirely for a period of time, uh, and the remainder at least got smaller or a few just stabilized. And then eventually resistance did develop and the tumors would regrow. Um, taking that orally bioavailable compound, the JH0083, we gave that by oral gavage to the mice um, and also saw a response to uh, JH2A3 in the neuroblast, the MCN amplified neuroblastoma flank tumor model. So um, we wanted to investigate metabolism in these tumor cells because we were using a, a glutamine metabolic inhibitor. So just a little bit more about kind of what Don does. So it's a, a Don analog, as I showed you on the previous slide. And it's been shown kind of by chemical analysis to irreversibly inhibit glutamine utilizing enzymes in the cell. Um, and so it can hit all sorts of different uh, processes. Um, and in order to investigate all those different processes, we did a, a couple of different metabolomic uh, techniques. Um, one in which we can just kind of globally assess the metabolites in the cells and look at literally hundreds of, of metabolites and say, are they up, are they down in response to Don therapy? And then another technique is to give the cells um, labeled uh, glutamine in this case, which essentially we replace the carbon, the standard carbon 12 with carbon 13 and we replace the nitrogen uh, 14 with nitrogen 15. And that, those labels allow us using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry to follow the carbons and the nitrogens throughout different metabolic processes in the cell, such as the TCA cycle, uh, or in this case, just one reaction, the conversion of aspartate, an amino acid, to asparagine by the donation of one nitrogen from glutamine. And we can look for the movement of that labeled nitrogen 
uh, into the asparagine uh, by the action of asparagine th synthetase. And our hypothesis would be that because glutamine is required for this reaction, that Don would inhibit it and would lead to a decrease in the asparagine production and possibly a concomitant increase in the precursor, the aspartate. And in the McCann amplified neuroblastoma cell lines, it's exactly what we see, that with treatment with Don, using uh, labeled glutamine, we see a decrease in the asparagine production and an increase in the aspartate, and the MCAN non-amplified cell lines are not affected. So then taking this back into the cells, we said, okay, well, asparagine, right? That, that's something that, as oncologists, we know about, especially in the liquid tumor uh, realm, where um, asparaginase, which is just an enzyme that degrades asparagine, is used as a mainstay of therapy in uh, hematologic malignancies, leukemia, lymphoma, um, and it's kind of readily available for testing. Um, and it has, in fact, been tested in solid tumors in the past and not been seen in clinical trials to have much of an effect as a single agent. Um, but we thought, okay, we've got Don inhibiting the new synthesis of asparagine in the cells. If we give the asparaginase to degrade the asparagine that's already there, perhaps these two would work together to um, inhibit the growth and kill uh, the MCAN amplified tumors uh, cells. And that's exactly what we see. So the, um, at doses that individually the, the DON or the JHUA3 and the asparaginase are not having much of an impact at all on the growth of the tumor cells, the combination of the two is um, very inhibitory uh, in terms of the cell growth. Um, and we can look at our other MCAN amplified cell line and we see the decrease in asparagine in the labeling experiment. We see the synergy of uh, inhibition of growth. We can take this over into the flank tumor model. Um, and in this case, it, these are flank tumors of the other MCAN amplified line, IMR32, which with glutamine inhibition alone, the, the tumors grow at a slower rate, uh, but do continue to grow. Then with the combination of, of the JHUA3 and the asparaginase, we see a, a stabilization, at least for a time, of growth of the tumors before resistance does eventually develop. Um, so having established all of this with MCAN amplified neuroblastoma, we wanted to validate this result in a, another model system. And um, rhabdomyosarcoma is another classic small round blue cell tumor uh, of childhood. It's the most common pediatric soft tissue sarcoma. Um, it's characterized primarily by uh, a different transcription factor than, than MCAN. It's a fusion transcription factor between uh, PAX3 or PAX7 and FOX01 primarily. Um, but it turns out that if you um, look in the literature that about 40 to 60 percent of fusion positive rhabdomyosarcomas that have been tested have in, in, at least an increase in MCAN expression, and many actually have a MCAN gain, or, and about 25% have MCAN amplification. And high expression or gain of MCAN in rhabdomyosarcoma has been shown in, in clinical trials to be associated with very poor prognosis above and beyond just the uh, fusion positive rhabdomyosarcoma itself. So we thought this was a pretty good system to validate our results with um, Don and asparaginase um, that we had seen in the neuroblastoma. And so we took a couple of cell lines, um, RH30, which has MCAN amplification in rhabdomyosarcoma, RH41 has MCAN gain, um, and compared it to a, a non-MCAN uh, high line and saw again, in just a standard growth assay, that they were more sensitive uh, with high MCN to uh, the glutamine metabolic inhibition using DON. We saw decreased proliferation, increased apoptosis using those same assays I discussed before. Um, then using the DON as a single agent in um, flank tumor models, we see that the MCN amplified rhabdomyosarcoma line grows more slowly with uh, Don therapy, again by intraperitoneal injection twice weekly. Whereas the non amplified rhabdomyosarcoma line is insensitive to Don therapy um, in the flank tumor model. So, again, looking at um, the stable isotope um, resolved metabolomic experiments, 
uh, assessing for um, uh, the generation of asparagine from aspartate by asparagine synthetase, we see that um, the treatment with Don in various um, uh, MICA and amplified or gain uh, rhodomyosarcoma sarcoma cell lines, we see a decrease in the asparagine, but no effect if the MICA uh, is non amplified in those lines. Um, and um, this allows us to then assess for the synergy. And again, we see that the combination of the two is, is more effective than either medication alone. Um, and then we can look at apoptosis um, and say, okay, um, sorry, and the red is not showing up here well, but you can see on the graph that um, the combination of Don and asparaginase in a, in a MICAN amplified um, rhabdomyosarcoma cell line leads to uh, significant increase in cellular killing um, compared to either of the medications alone. So um, trying to figure out the mechanism of how um, asparagine depletion is leading to increased cell death, again, we looked to the literature and um, found the, uh, what's called the uncharged tRNA or integrated stress response. So this is, um, a process that cells have to sense uh, depletion of key nutrients. So in this case, um, with, when asparagine is low, you get what's called an uncharged tRNA. So tRNA is kind of part of the translation machinery to make um, new proteins. And if you can't load the, the tRNA with the amino acid that goes with it, um, there's a signaling cascade that gets set off going through these proteins that are listed GCN2, which is a kinase, ATF4, which is a transcription factor. And so the normal response is what's on the left side. So the transcription factor ATF4 senses through GCN2 that the, there's no asparagine around. So it tells asparagine synthetase, make more asparagine. And then that shuts off the right side of the pathway, which is to send the cells to, to die. But if you have asparaginase around, then asparagine is depleted and um, the pathway tries to go down the left side and make more, but then if Don is there saying, asparagine synthetase, I'm not gonna let you do your job, then the cells are forced into uh, an apoptotic cascade. And so um, I'm still trying to reproduce these experiments in, in my neuroblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma model systems, but as you'll see um, on the poster from uh, a postdoc in our lab, Dr. Allison Hannaford, uh, who's here today, um, in MIC-driven group C medulloblastoma, where we've also uh, used as kind of a model system for testing um, these glutamine metabolic inhibitors and the combination with asparaginase, we see that this pathway acts exactly as we would expect it to from the literature, that um, ATF4 is activated, CHOP, which is a pro-apoptotic code protein is activated, and we get increased apoptosis as measured by uh, increased levels of the uh, cleave PARP. And um, I'm actively working to um, reproduce uh, these results in my model system. So in conclusion, um, with mcn driven pediatric solid tumors, uh, we see an increased reliance on glutamine for cellular metabolism. We see that these um, tumors and cell lines are more sensitive to glutamine metabolic inhibition uh, than uh, cell lines that have uh, that lack MCN amplification, that Don um, and the prodrug uh, JA283 uh, are able to prevent asparagine production in the cells, and that uh, by merit of this, they synergize with asparaginase to kill MCN driven cancers by both inhibiting um, the new production of asparagine and by getting rid of the asparagine that's already there. Um, and we believe that the mechanism of increased killing involves this uncharged tRNA integrated stress response. So um, in terms of my neuroblastoma work, that's farther along, and um, we're in the process of getting that ready for publication. In terms of the rhabdomyosarcoma, that's a little bit more preliminary, and I'm still working to validate um, the synergy, both in vitro and in vivo, and uh, to confirm um, with in vivo metabolomic experiments using the flank tumor models that asparagine is depleted in response to glutamine metabolic inhibition. Um, and then as I mentioned, verifying that the uncharged tRNA response is, is 
the mechanism by which these cells are, are dying. The translational potential of this project is, is um, significant. Um, we believe that um, this work provides the preclinical justification for the use of DAWN in um, pediatric MCN driven solid tumors. And we are in the process of exploring um, new DAWN clinical trials in carefully selected patients that we um, would expect to respond to this therapy. Then, as I said before, we're working closely with the Johns Hopkins Drug Discovery Group to develop new pro-drugs of DAWN that are, you know, in the case of JHU083, orally bioavailable, but there's also ongoing efforts to develop tumor-directed DAWN pro-drugs that would uh, preferentially uh, affect the tumor cells and uh, spare normal uh, cells. And then, um, the efforts of Johns Hopkins Drug Discovery have, have led to the founding of a, a company called Drayson Pharmaceuticals, um, and they recently uh, secured $40 million in venture capital, venture capital funding and um, are actively working to develop clinical trials for the Don Pro drugs themselves. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the members of uh, the Rob and Eberhardt Labs. Um, Specifically, Allison Hannaford, whose work on medulloblastoma has inspired some of the work that I've done on neuroblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma. And then we have a metabolomics expert in the lab, Brad Poor, who has helped me a lot with the um, learning metabolism and um, how to do all of those experiments. Um, and then I'd also um, like to acknowledge CCF for providing funding for uh, Dr. Rob and, and Dr. Rubens in our lab, and then also we've had funding support um, for the neuroblastoma research from Alex's Lemonade Stand and the NCI SKCCC core grant. Well, very good, uh, very nice presentation. And, Thank you. Um, uh, we'll have some time for questions. Um, is it a coincidence that the drug is named Don and your division chief is named Don and, and it's going to potentially dawn a new day for therapy? I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll let you, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know. He, does, he, does he get any, any royalty? Because the he should. He, he should. Um, I, I tried to find a drug named Pat, but it's not out there. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's got to be a metabolite named Pat somewhere, right? <laughs> you know, Polyadenyl something or other. That should be easy, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, if there's any questions, um, I'm going to actually uh, start with the first question, okay. which is sort of, um, I don't know if you, if you I, I'm trying, I was like, uh, did you actually show mechanistically what Mick, how Mick N is sort of driving this pathway? Is there, is it known how Mick N integrates with this metabolic pathway at the very top? Because it, it's all very impressive down the screen, but. Well, it's, it's known that various, um, you know, glutamine use, utilizing enzymes are upregulated downstream of MYC. I, I didn't show that, but that's established in the literature. Okay. Questions? We have time for a few questions. Discussion? Pat. Yes. Oh, oh and Pat. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that was great. Like, uh, I think um, I'm Pat Brown from the Johns Hopkins. Um, one question I have is there's another uh, mechanism of MYC targeting. Another mechanism of MIC targeting that, hello, yeah. <laughs> Another mechanism of MIC targeting that I've, I've seen referred to are bromo do domain inhibitors, okay. um, that somehow that um, affects um, MIC expression and has been postulated. Is there a way for you to compare kind of side to side in your models bromo domain inhibitors or other things that are purported to target the MIC pathway in terms of relative potency. A lot of times we see, you know, talks like this, which are great, but they f are so focused on mm -hmm. one drug, but comparing that drug's effect in the same models versus, say, standard chemotherapy or against other targeted agents that are purported to target the same pathway so that we get some idea of the rel relative priority. Okay. Is that something that, that you guys have thought about doing or have you done and do you have a sense of that yet? It's not something I've thought about doing. Um, Certainly, the bromo domain inhibitors are, are the kind of leading direct kind of MYC inhibitors that, that have been developed um, and are used um, to, to good effect in the laboratory setting but haven't really translated clinically. Uh, I have not 
uh, considered in the past doing a side-by-side -side comparison, um, but it's certainly worth considering. While the mic is going back there, I have another sort of interesting thought. Um, you may or may not be aware, but taking, meta you know, taking metabolites or nutrients out of tumors um, in neuroblastoma has actually been an idea for a really long time. And one of the metabolite, one of the nutrients that people pulled out back in the 80s and the 90s was iron. Okay. And there's a lot of really impressive hmm. studies in neuroblastoma, at least in cell lines and animal models, showing the chelation of iron hmm. is also a cru crucial um, you know, uh, nutrient or element for the, for the tumors to grow. Have you thought about combining any of the iron chelation strategies with this as another way of um, sort of two hits of, of inhibiting tumor growth? So iron specifically, I have I've not thought about that, and I'll, I'll need to look into that uh, literature. But um, there have been efforts in other solid tumors, um, kind of more on the colon cancer, lung cancer side of things on the adult side, where they combine glutamine metabolic inhibition, inhibition with um, glycolysis inhibition and fatty acid inhibition, and, and the combination of different metabolic inhibitors in that respect have shown kind of combinatorial and per perhaps sometimes synergistic effects by just hitting metabolism at multiple nodal points that the tumor cells need to survive. Um, but iron specifically is not something that I, I, I personally have seen combined with glutamine metabolic inhibition, and I'm not very familiar with that literature, at, uh, but it's, it sounds like something that's worth looking into. Sure. So the original adult clinical trial in the 1950s for Don, the, the biggest toxicity was GI in terms of nausea and vomiting. Um, but then actually in the pediatric clinical trial, um, GI toxicity was not prominent. Um, and there was some um, myosuppression that was fairly mild. And um, they actually did not uh, reach a tolerability limit. There was no maximum tolerable dose in the pediatric clinical trial. They ask if there is a particular. Um, so the question was, um, is there, based on the, these results, is there a dietary kind of metabolically based uh, uh, recommendation that we could make to patients for how to help to prevent their tumors from growing? Um, and, and I mean, the real answer is if you were going to, the, the, the tumors are, are very good, right, at getting the essential nutrients that they need um, from the organism as a whole. Um, and in order to deplete glutamine on an organismal level, like on a, for the child, to an extent that you would affect the tumor growth, you'd, it would be too harmful to the individual um, in that process. And, and um, so I don't believe there's any dietary modification you could make based on these results that could um, impact the tumor growth because um, it would just be overall too damaging for the individual. Try again, almost. Uh, Micah, so the, I've, we've talked about this before. So when tumors become resistant to this, do you, do you think it's that apoptotic mechanism that's maybe faulty or are the cells just switching to a different metabolic pathway? You know, just to, and is that just an in vivo thing where the tumors become resistant or can you model that in vitro like it's, that it's, or is it a, yeah, so, so in vitro, um, you can model it. You can, if you continuously treat uh, these cell lines um, with Dawn, they, they can continue to grow um, 
and, and they become resistant, um, it, it takes a while. Um, in, in vivo, they definitely become resistant um, to Don. And I, I do have plans to characterize the metabolic changes uh, and expression changes and other things in resistant tumors. I just have not done that work yet. So I, I, I would like to know the answer to that question myself, but I don't currently have an answer for you, Brian. All right. Okay. Well, we'll thank Micah.